What is up, guys? Today on the Football Guys Dynasty Football Show, we're diving into the rookie running backs, our favorite topic. Christian's been so excited about this topic all week. I can't wait to see the takes from Christian here. But let's talk about the narratives first. So before we dive into individual players and kind of going over this, the, the 24 class for the running backs is all over the board. You go through every analyst out there. I bet you they have different top three, every single one of them, just kind of going through there. And it's kind of a pick your poison or pick your, I don't know, your flavor, just depending on what side you go there of the the running backs you don't like and the running backs you do like. And we've done a deep dive into probably one of the most comprehensive guides out there, uh, 37 running backs. And we kind of talked about them and we know all about them, but even us, we're still sitting here like, I don't know, this is our top five, but we're not that confident. Um, we think we know what we're talking about, but the draft will tell us a lot. So what is your kind of narrative or what is your kind of take about this class as a whole before we get into this, Jeff? <laughs> The common narrative is that it's a weak class, largely because there's not a standalone or standalone two options at the top of the class, just like we saw last year with Bijan Robinson and Jameer Gibbs. There's not a player that you're considering taking in your first round of a super flex draft right now, absent a great landing spot. But I think that that's yeah. the real key. I think that there is a, a group of very talented runners, and I think there are a group of very intriguing landing spots that are available, that it's almost the inverse of what you saw last year where you saw Bijan Robinson, Jameer Gibbs go at the very top of the draft. But some of these players that we were excited about, like Zach Charbonnet or Tajay Spears, Kendra Miller landed in landing spots that really took a lot of the value off of them. You could have the inverse this year where players that you're not excited about land with the Cowboys or the Chargers, even the Chiefs or the Bills, potentially that there are a lot of high octane, high power. The Bengals are another one offenses that have openings that these rookies could step into. Yeah, I'm of the same mindset. I think this is a, a deep class in terms of there's a ton of different skill sets in this class. You, if you need a specific, you know, third down back, you can find one. If you need a north south runner, you can find one. If you need a guy that can yeah. probably be a three down back, but you might not want him to be uh, immediately, we've got a ton of those in this class. So this is one where I always mention we we get uh overexcited probably about these classes that have the Bijan and have the Jameer Gibbs. And that's great. And and those are really good dynasty assets at this moment. But I also think that there's a chance that this class produces more fantasy relevant guys than some of those other classes because uh, of the landing spot situations that they could run into. But also uh, just they have skill sets that translate to fantasy points that, that that can be true about probably 12 15 guys in this class. It's just determining which ones to take in rookie drafts. Uh, we're going to hopefully help you through that. Uh, but landing spot is going to be critical. That, that version three of the rookie guide is, is very crucial for the running backs this year. Yeah, that's what I would say is, I, you know, I think they all, I think Christian on the head, you know, there is a flavor for every team. If they need a downhill guy, there's tons of guys like that. There's pass catchers in this class. You're like, wow, this guy, Tyrone Tracy, for example, he might not be a guy that we talk about today maybe we'll talk about a little later but i mean he was a receiver now he's a running back and now he's getting a little bit buzz out there already top 10 for some guys top five for some big draft guys so guys like that are definitely fillable if they get a, a fun spot yeah 3.0 rookie guide will be giving you guys that right after the draft and they definitely hey landing spots gonna really really matter for these guys um you know i think consensus out there your favorite spots are dallas uh, I think Arizona is a sneaky spot too for a late round guy. I really like that spot with James Conner getting a little older. You know, Amari DiMicardo is okay, but nothing that really flashes for me. Um, and I think that, you know, Connor hasn't finished the season, I don't think, his whole career. Uh, and when you're looking at that, I think those kind of spots are interesting, too. Those are spots to watch out there. Um, so, like, for me, obviously, Dallas, to me, is the best spot. Uh, but, Jeff, if you, if you couldn't pick Dallas, where's the other spot you would like to see running back go? Who's putting you on the spot? Am I missed? Did Baltimore land somebody? Because uh, it seems like Derek they're Henry. Oh, Derek. Derek Henry. Derek okay, I dude, I'm so tired, and I apologize. Yes, Derek <laughs> Henry's a good player. No. Um, I I think the the bagels. I think sand as a pretty yeah. solid spot. I know that people are excited about Zach Moss coming off what he did last year and then chase Brown as well. But if the Bengals were to step in and land one of these top players, you could see them take over as the lead back there. And I think that that would be an interesting landing spot. Can I give two underrated? landing spots that I, I really yeah. like Why Carolina not? Panthers. That's yeah, true. That's true. Uh, Carolina Panthers, uh, number one, I think that they've done a lot of good things to put talent around 
Bryce Young, but I also think that they need a running back. They, right now we're starting Chuba Hubbard, uh, and Miles Sanders is still there, but that is a team that needs a, a running back that they're going to turn the ball over to in situations, and they've committed to running the football. I think they want to upgrade there. And then the New York Giants, uh, you know, we talk about these high-octane offenses, and, and that is – a big part of a good landing spot. The other side of a good landing spot is just volume. And I think that those two uh, teams offer those opportunities to those guys. The Giants out of Devin Singletary, I think he'll be a piece of that backfield, but it's clear they don't really care for Eric Gray uh, based on how he didn't get on the field last year. So uh, I'm sad about that. I I liked Eric Gray a little bit, but uh, I think that those two teams could add a back and we could be talking about them as a really, really valuable piece in the second round of rookie drafts this year. All right, let's dive into the players. But before we get there, make sure you're downloading the Rookie Guide. Rookie Guide version 2.0 just came out. Version 3.0 is less than a month away. We're so excited to be diving in that for you guys. Uh, And Football Guys Fridays still happening on Reddit. So you've heard us talk about this for the last couple of weeks, but this is an AMA series. It's tackling uh, free agency, the NFL draft, Uh, you know, all Three of us were on there at one point, but we've got a ton of football guys analysts that have been crushing it. Uh, Jagger May was two weeks ago. I think Sigmund Bloom was last week. And then we've got uh, Matt Waldman on there this week. So uh, join that's on the fantasy football Reddit r slash fantasy football. I'm sure there's a post out there. Go ask your questions now. And before we move on, take a moment to like this video. Talk to us about this running back class. What do you like? Comment with below with any questions or trades or in your iTunes review. Go ahead and give leave us a, a five-star review. Um, even if you don't like Jeff, you still got to leave us that five-star review. Come on, guys. Um, all right, Jalen Wright. Let's get into Jalen Wright. Let's talk about him. Um, and again, we're going to go through our top five running backs. These are consensus. This is probably – I don't think this is Jeff's running back one. We've liked Jalen Wright for a while, so like you can't – don't yell at us all. Like we all have kind of different consensus here. We're just going to go through these guys. And like we said, pre, you know, the ad reads that we just did, a lot of guys are different. So when we talk about these guys, we're talking about skill sets and where they're at. So Jalen Wright is our number one right now in the guide. Um, he was pre combine one because I was kind of the area scout. I was looking at that. He came out with a relative ac- athletic scores, 9.81, 4, 3, 8, 40. It came in, I think the the best thing for him, he came in at 5'11", 210. And there was some question marks about what his weight was going to be. Um, some people were calling him a small boy out there on social media. Then he came in at 210. I don't see any of those posts anymore. They must have got deleted. Um, and to me, you know, Jalen, to me, one of the more explosive backs in the class. And when you saw his speed, that that really translated really well there. Has experience in a lot of different schemes. And I think that Tennessee scheme allowed him to kind of be horizontal, very zone um, scheme as well. I like what they were able to do with him and the kind of versatile there. Very big playability. You have to love that. Um, little things about him probably needs to refine some things. You know, lateral agility, line of scrimmage, those type of things. Um, but we really like him here. I'm going to go to Christian first because I know he likes Jalen as well. And then Jeff can poo-poo our dreams and talk about maybe why he's kind of worried about him. Yeah, Jalen has also been my RB1 for this entire process, actually. Um, you know, before the combine, I was kind of expecting a, a really good combine from him. When you watch the film, he's the one player that, like, he has that home run ability. And while I I traditionally say that that's an overrated aspect of playing running back. There are also some really good things. There's a lot of patience behind the line of scrimmage. He's consistently hitting open holes. I think that Wright is certainly a a developmental piece. You probably don't want him as your starter as a a rookie, but I also think that he can get you 10 touches and he's going to be explosive with those touches. And then that's going to turn into fantasy points. I think one of the other things is he's he's pretty good in pass protection as well. And so you're looking at a player who has a three down skill set that can generate big plays, even if he's not generating the 25 yarders all the time, like he was at Tennessee, he'll probably be one of those guys that's averaging like six, seven, eight yards a carry, and then he'll work his way into more playing time. So right to me, it's more of a projection, but he's also younger than a lot of this running back class. I, I think that he's a guy that when all is said and done, I I feel pretty comfortable projecting him as a day two back. And at this moment, that's part of the evaluation is trying to project where they're going to go in the draft. And I, I think that he'll land in, in probably round three and hopefully to one of these good landing spots. I think one of the biggest things that um, I've seen, and I understand we're, we're trying at some level to project volume 
<laughs> that that's where running back points t- trad- traditionally have come out of. But I think that what we've seen the kind of the morphing of the current NFL is that you got to be able to make something with what you have the opportunity for. Devon Shane is a perfect example of that. Or a guy like James Cook is kind of at his ceiling in touches, but that doesn't mean he can't still end up as a running back one with that workload because you're, you're starting to see quarterbacks are, are picking up some of the rushing. You're getting some wide receivers involved in the run game. Teams are purposely having multiple backs that can contribute. And so what you want, and I think what Wright brings you is a player that can drop 25 points, 30 points in the game, break off two long runs and, and have two long touchdown runs and be able to do that. I think the days of Ideally, probably the days of having one back that touches the ball 25 times in a game regularly is a little bit outdated and and just kind of not what the NFL is trying to do right now. And so I that's in that term for fantasy, I like right quite a bit. I think that there's clear separation in our top four, and I think that we're all kind of there in our top four running backs, and we'll get there on all four of those. But what I see from all of them is a three down skill set and the ability to be that player that can be on the field for those three downs and to be able to pick up that situational usage and and looking at potential touchdowns, looking at potential involvement in the passing game. I think those are the things that we should be hunting right now in fantasy outside of just looking out of a running back. And so, Again, I think that you did a great job there breaking down Wright's game and having that ability to to break those big plays. He's a little bit lower on my board, just only slightly, because I think some of the other guys are a little bit more skilled in the passing game, develop, step into having some maybe some of those bigger roles. But at the same time, I, I think you're exactly right in valuing him where you are because of that big play upside and and those ability to have splash games. So I was going through the mocks for Jalen Wright about landing spot. And here's his round three landing spot for every team. The Giants were mocked for him, which that'd be fun. Like Christian kind of talked about the Chargers, which is a good spot. It would be a very good spot for Jalen Wright um, out there. Um, I saw the Cardinals, the Cowboys, and I saw the Browns. So those are all spots. So like, like Jeff's talked about, like if you can find a guy that has a three down skill set like they do and they get one of those spots I just listed, you, they should go higher up your board. That's kind of how you look at that um, because they have that. Go ahead, Christian. So I mocked him to the, to the Packers in one of my recent mocks in the third round simply because while I think the Packers have some needs on the defensive side of the ball, they added Josh Jacobs. They brought back A.J. Dillon, but this A.J. Dillon thing is not a long-term thing at all. And you lost Aaron Jones. So now that's a situation where maybe they go look to replace a, the explosive piece of their game with a guy like Jalen Wright. How would you guys feel if he was second fiddle to Josh Jacobs in Green Bay? I mean, I think everybody would be disappointed given the potential openings and landing spots. But I think, again, I, I talked about Char- Charbonnet, Kenry Miller, even Jameer Gibbs to some level and sharing a backfield with David Montgomery. That's kind of what teams want to do. They want to be able to have two backs to be able to keep them fresh, to be able to rotate them through situations. And then they're basically saying, we know one of these guys are going to get hurt. So we don't want our offense to entirely be dead if one of these guys are hurt. And so that's where uh, I think that it's, it's interesting because God forbid Josh Jacobs misses any time. Obviously, the value would be there. But again, it would be a disappointment given some of the potential openings that are sitting around the league. I think it'd be a disappointment, but I think if he's running back to a depth chart at the beginning of August, I'd take it. And I think he could be, right, with that Dylan thing. So that's the other thing to kind of look at. If you feel like he could be running back to Now, that's a slippery slope because I thought Tank Bigsby was <laughs> running back to a Jacksonville last year, and that didn't turn out that way. Um, but I do think Wright is more explosive than Tank Bigsby was. So like, I think there are some things to like about his game. All right, let's jump over there. Our running back two in terms of right now consensus, right? Consensus. Marshawn Lloyd, USC running back. I, I know he's a guy that Jeff likes. I think we all kind of liked him. We've liked him pretty much uh, through the whole process. Uh, you know, former South Carolina running back. He went to USC this last year, 820 yards, nine touchdowns. Um, we like him because of what everything we've been saying, you know, versatile back is a pretty good pass catcher, you know, not didn't have a ton of receptions there, but has some usage there. You like that. Um, I think efficient runner with breakaway ability is kind of what I put in the guide. Um, but I really like his ability to be versatile and schemes too, inside zone, outside zone, power concepts, Marshawn Lloyd's that guy. And he came in at five, nine, two twenty, right. And he ran a four, four, five, four, four, six in that range, 9.29 relative athletic score. A lot of things I like about 
about Marshawn Lloyd. And again, same landing spots out there that I keep getting mentioned. And I think the nice thing about him, he's so versatile in those in in those schemes. I think if he goes into a, you know, any inside zone, outside zone, any of that kind of stuff, you have to like him there. He can be used in a lot of different ways. Christian, what's your takeaway from Marshawn Lloyd? Love him. Uh, he was my RB1 until I watched Jalen Wright. So he's my RB2 right now. Um, this is a player that, you know, when we talk about Caleb Williams, we often talk about, oh man, the situation around him was really rough. And then when we talk about Marshawn Lloyd, we don't talk about how, you know, even in the run game, these this offensive line was just atrocious. And so you're going to see a lot of analysis that says, you know, his vision between the tackles isn't very good. He kicks it outside. No, he, he was just creating out of nothing. And to me, I think that there's still some development that does need to happen with his between the tackles work. But I also think that when you have that level of explosiveness, that level of elusiveness, um, that ability to break off the big play, like we talked about with Jalen Wright, this is a kid that I'm really willing to bet on. We saw him just consistently get better in college. And there, I think those stats kind of lie to you in terms of like, if USC had a competitive defense, this is a kid that probably would have run for 1,300 yards uh, because they were just in negative game scripts consistently where Caleb had to throw 40, 50 times a game, maybe not 50. That feels like hyperbole, but something close to that because they were just consistently giving up points on the other end. To me, when you put Marshawn Lloyd in an NFL-level offense, I think we're going to see an even better player than we saw in college, and the player we saw in college was a really good player. So I'm betting on him. I, I will scoop him up based on what his value is in rookie drafts. But I think if he goes to a, a good landing spot, he might end up some people's RB ones, including mine by the end of it. Yeah. I think him and probably Trey Benson are best positioned to be those, those primary backs that stay on the field and, and again, you talk about the shifting usage in an NFL run game. Lloyd has a little bit of both in, in the ability to hit that big play and to give you that splash play, but also to have that a little bit more of a grinder mindset. And then you mentioned 220. I mean, you love to see that. I think that that's probably an ideal target. And so to have that explosion in there, have the polish in the in the passing game and have that that size, that frame, uh, you roll all that together. And that's a player that I think has the highest upside potentially in this class yeah big fan i think that i think that you hit on the head too when you talked about like had he had better just game scripts we would have saw a lot more production and i mean that is huge if you i know some, a lot of you don't watch college football if you watch a usc game for half of a core like half of a half you'd be like what the hell is this defense and what is going on out here um because lloyd just couldn't get out there um and that was really the biggest thing there um i also i even the last thing i want to touch on though you know, I think that he has really good IQ, especially in um, pass blocking. That was one thing I noted in my, 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 when I was going through my scouting stuff with him, I highlighted that a lot. Like, man, very, very good here. Really protects his quarterback has that, has that oomph to go get it too. He's not afraid to put his head in there and those type of things, those things matter. Um, uh, and if he can stay out there, yeah, the, then that's, and those are these two guys, him and then Trey Benson's at three for us and Trey Benson, whoo. His combine really, it didn't catch, I guess it caught me off guard a little bit. How good it was. 9.77 relative athletic score, 4.3940. Were you guys expecting 4.3940? Because I was not expecting 4.3940. So there were reports last summer that he was running in the 4.3s. And I was like, I saw him at the beginning of last year. I said, no way. Like, he must have been hurt to start this year because he had a slow start with that Florida State offense. Maybe that was what kind of muddied my view of him, but there were the reports. Apparently people knew I didn't, I didn't believe them. Well, we didn't know. Uh, and yeah, that's the thing. I think early on in that year, he must've been banged up because he did not look like the same running back. And I think that's for the uh, many people expected him to have over a thousand yards rushing. And he got 900, have that breakout year. He had an okay year, you know, that second, that first year at Florida state had 990 yards and nine touchdowns. Um, the big thing for Trey, he tested awesome. That's that's great, right? Broad jump, 10, two inches, whatever it was. Powerful runner. He does a lot of good job there. Burst and long speed is pretty good. I think he utilizes a combination of that pretty well. Um, now, I, the thing that I think the red flags that you have to be mentioned, right? 2020, where he started his career at Oregon, uh, he tours ACL, MCL, lateral meniscus, medical meniscus, and a tendon and hamstring all at one time. 
massive, gruesome in- injury. He's bounced back, though. But it is just something to note. Hey, that knee is definitely, when you're thinking of a dynasty asset, just something to think about as you're looking at that knee, kind of like Gurley and these guys that we've seen in the past, just to kind of know. Now, the way running backs are valued now, I don't think that's a big deal because it's basically, what have you done for me lately? What are you doing for me this next week? So just but to note that. And I think for me, the weaknesses that I've really pinpointed in kind of my drafting profile you know, lacks creativity in the open field. I think he's a very good north-south guy. I think he gets up, um, and he could definitely pull away. But he doesn't make a ton of guys miss in the open field. Like, it's not one of those guys that he misses. He looks for contact almost. Um, and his pass blocking is terrible. So the one thing I do notice, like, yeah, he could be a three-down guy. Pass blocking is something that he's got to work on there. Um, Jeff, what's your takeaway of Trey? I think that if if he were as good as some people think he is, he would have been good. Um, last year is kind of my takeaway. Uh, when you look at it, he had one massive, massive game against Virginia Tech, 11 rushes for 200 yards, and you take that away, is his productions in very, very pedestrian. Given everything that was around him, given positive game strips, given dominant talent relative to opponents, given having two NFL wide receivers on the field with him. And, and so that's where... Um, and having Jordan Travis, obviously a mobile quarterback that's very experienced, you just would have thought he would have been better given the situation. And especially at the end of the year, when we saw Travis go down, I mean, that was that was his opportunity, I think, to really take the team on his shoulders and to say, I'm, I'm this offense now. I'm going to deliver us across the finish line, get us into the college football playoff. And yeah, he had three touchdowns against Florida, decent game against Florida. But I mean, the Louisville game was a slog. And, and even the game against North Alabama where, where Jordan Travis got hurt, it was a terrible game for him too. And so those that's just kind of my takeaway of, of if he was as good as he's supposed to be, then he would have been good. But um, that's kind of, I don't know where I land. No, I think... I- so he was my summer scouting RB2 behind Travion Henderson. Uh, and, and so when I talked about, you know, Marshawn Lloyd was my RB1, that was later in the season. Things evolved. And like I said, early season, Trey Benson uh, was pretty rough. He had that big breakout game. I think that was week six, but it took until after a bye. And then after that, like the production did dip and, and mm-hmm. it wasn't the same player that we saw the year before. I, I don't think he was forcing as many missed tackles that he was fairly elusive in 2022 we saw him you know be able to at least generate a little bit of you know broken tackle ability but that just it just wasn't there as much this last year and so I I get a little concerned about that because we'll get to Blake Corum here in a little bit but we I specifically have hammered home like he hasn't looked the same since he had his knee injury last year And so now we're talking about a player who has had a gruesome injury. He had one really good year and, you know, with running backs, maybe the wheels are already starting to fall off. I know that sounds a little crazy with an incoming rookie, but that's how it can happen. And so I I do have a little bit of pause. He is still up there because I think the highest level of him, what we saw in 2022, that's a borderline, you know, top 12 back in dynasty, because I think he does have a skill set that translates. It's just, I don't know which version we're going to get for his NFL career. Expanding kind of mentioning that point, expanding on that point. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing with NIL, we're seeing with the Ohio state with Judkins moving to Ohio state to, to pair with Henderson. It seems like these backs are a lot more cognizant about lowering their workload when they're in college and hitting the NFL fresher. Now that seems to go counter intuitive against what a lot of the analytical data has said in terms of fantasy production, where you want a guy that's been a massive fantasy producer in college. And that's the number one thing that's going to translate to the NFL in terms of production. And, And so I'm, I'm really curious on if how outdated maybe that, that data might be already given how rapidly college football has changed and how aggressively it seems that some of these players are preserving themselves. And if it's not better to look for a player like Jalen Wright, or even like a Marshawn Lloyd that did see less usage relative to one of these backs that were kind of the bell cow in their offense. Yeah, no, I think, I think those are all good points. I think that's what we're talking about when they're talking about narrative of the class what are these guys, you know, where are they going to go, where they could get drafted? Um, But, you know, are you going to take upside? Like, you know, I think, I think Benson has a pretty, I don't want to say safe with a running back, but a floor that you're like, okay, he probably gonna get some usage. He's probably gonna get the draft capital. Like if you had to guess today, who's the first running back taken Trey Benson. 
maybe so maybe the next maybe. guy maybe next guy let's get into him look yeah. at that segue you're a professional christian williams all right jonathan brooks now me i'm about to go to battle boys because i know these two guys don't like him as much as i like jonathan brooks but i am a fan of jonathan brooks i think when you're looking at him before he tore his acl so he did tear his acl he had 1100 yards 10 touchdowns he had 286 yards receiving 25 receptions um and before he tore that i think he was running back one of the class i think he probably would have been running back one of the class because hey people really love what he was doing out there um when he pre now he can't test obviously because of that acl now it seems like he'll be back it probably be back based on all the injury gurus out there they said he probably will make it back um before the i don't know they some some are saying like week one some are saying like week four somewhere in there but he'll be back this year at least to get out there a little bit but we always know with acls and running backs they're going to take a little longer to develop so it's one of those things you are gonna have to wait a little bit as a running back, the things I like about him, you know, I think he's very patient and he and he's instinctive. He lets holes open. I think he does a good job of letting his offensive line create for him. Really good lower body strength. Contact balance was good. I think now nah, that was pre-injury, but contact balance for me always kind of stood out there. And you know what? Pass catching ability. I think it's going to lead him to having that three down kind of skill set. He could be out there for three downs there. But Hey, I can't just mention Jonathan Brooks or excuse me, Trey Benson's injury and be like, oh, Brooks is all right. He did injury he tore his ACL. Something to note there. Um, I think that, you know, thinking of like, hey, he's got to put some weight on probably, depending on where he came in at. He was listed at 216, but with that ACL, I don't know where he's at. Uh, but overall, I, I, I like him a lot for what he is and for the value you're probably going to get because of the ACL. So if he does get drafted somewhere, I know he's getting rumored up the Yahoo to the Cowboys because their team doctor is the one that repaired his knee. So everybody just assumes that's where he's going to go. If he goes there, I'm all aboard the train because I love the Cowboy landing spot. Um, but I like Brooks probably more than these guys. Jeff, what'd you take on Brooks? I like Brooks quite a bit too. I think I was probably unfair to him um, when we had our initial talk a couple of months ago about him. And I said there wasn't a big fall off in the, the dollar in the, um, Texas offense with him yeah. out of the lineup. I think there I was. I, I mean, yeah, okay. that, that was probably a bad take on my part, and I apologize for that. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to pull the clip and, and tweet about it, go no, right ahead and, and enjoy yourselves. But <laughs> other than that, no, I think that Brooks um, does have, a, you know, I talked about Lloyd potentially having the highest upside in the class. I think Brooks is probably the, pl the player that does have that. I want to play a game with you guys. Is the first running back going to go over or under pick 56 in the draft? Is that the Cowboys pick? Yeah. The Cowboys pick in the second Push. round that I think I think they're Push. taking him here. <laughs> Push. Yes. I yeah. think so too. Yeah. Brooks to me, this is one of those cases of this player is good at a lot of things, but he's not great at anything. Um and and to me, those players can be really good for fantasy. I think when I try to come up with a comparison for Jonathan Brooks that's not stolen from the rookie guide, um, which Kevin put together, but he just reminds me of like a a bigger James Cook. And I every time I say that, while talking about how I'm lower on Jonathan Brooks, I'm like, man, I would take a bigger James Cook on my dynasty rosters pretty easily and comfortably um, because I think that that skill set is a translatable thing. Um, that said, the injury does concern me a little bit. I think the actual, like, he's kind of the inverse of the last three guys that we talked about and that I don't think he's got that breakaway speed. I think he's, uh, you know, fine. He's got adequate speed, but... I think you're really more excited about the burst and, you know, the five to six yard gains over the 20 to 30 yard gains. And that's OK. Um, like I said, breakaway speed, long speed is some of the most overrated stuff with running backs, in my opinion. So to me, every time I talk about him and talk about how I'm lower on him, I kind of talk myself into him. And this is one where the landing spot will bump him up my rankings a little bit. He's yeah. my RB5 right now. So um, I, I'm pretty comfortable drafting him based on now based on his current value in rookie drafts i'm not so i think hopefully that changes a little bit but we'll see we'll see where the landing spot dictates um you know his what his value will be but he's a good player i just i don't see the special in him and i don't know if i ever will but i don't know if it ever will matter i would love for him to go to a gap scheme like that, that's really what I was looking at when I was going through his stuff. Like, I really want him to go somewhere there. You know, you know, who runs the best offense for him, but they're already, I mean, the lions are amazing at what they do and the, the rushing attack. Like I wish, I wish someone else to pick up the Lions scheme and just kind of run it uh, for these guys. Cause I think that he fits extremely well into that scheme. Um, yeah, but I think to your point, he, I, yeah, I don't know if he's a lead at anything, but maybe this class, because of all the narrative and we're talking about, maybe if you're just good at, 
average at everything, you're probably maybe could be the best running back of the class too. So I think that's kind of where you land with these guys where you're like, well, he doesn't necessarily do this extremely well, but he does it efficient enough to where he's going to be able to be on the field and get fantasy points. Uh, Jeff, any final thoughts on Jonathan or as a whole? Yeah, I, I think that um, – as, as I kind of work it through my mind, if you were to land with Baltimore, I think that would be incredibly interesting because I think that that would be a spot that the initial take would be a lot of disappointment and people would maybe devalue him. But when you look at kind of de- the runway on Derrick Henry and what he would do in that offense, I think that would be an amazing landing spot long term. And I think that would be an amazing buy opportunity if he were to land there because of all the initial pushback that you would see. But I think he would fit it incredibly well next to Lamar Jackson long term. I want him to go wherever uh, Quinn Ewers ends up next year. That's <laughs> so I don't know what that'll be, but that's what that's where I want him to be. Oh, man. UFL. All right. Uh, let's get into this last guy here. Braylon Allen, number five. And then we'll jump over to the podcast. If you watch on YouTube, jump over to the podcast here. We're going to go even deeper than that. Braylon Allen comes in at five for us, which is funny because collectively we've kind of been haters. And so, you know, when we're talking about Braylon Allen there, um, we've been guys that are like, hey, we just I don't know if we see it there. I know some people have missed running back one of the class. Um, and so there's definitely different viewpoints of this kid. He came in at six one. 235, but I really feel like he plays above that, like 240-ish. I know he came in the combine trying to do there. I think the biggest thing with Brandon Allen, hey, he had two, you know, a back-to-back thousand-yard seasons in Wisconsin. He had 984 this last year. Didn't look as good. Um, but he's young, right? Everybody's gonna talk about how young he is. Probably one of the youngest prospects in the class. Um, definitely is big, powerful runner. He's that north-south kid that you really want in your offense to score touchdowns patience ish. Like when you watch him, he he allows him to develop there. Um, and you like him being a red zone weapon. I mean, he could just fall in the end zone and score touchdowns because of his size and everything there. I think the one thing I wanted to ask Jeff about, you know, he didn't run the 40. There's a reason why Braylon Allen didn't run the 40. He knows what he would have ran. I think will teams move away from that? Or are they just like, Hey, maybe he's doing it privately in the private workouts and all that stuff. But you know, by all accounts, we know why he didn't run the 40 yard dash probably because what he's a four, six kid. Four seven in that range, and we know that's going to just drop his stock. It's probably smart of him to do it, but will NFL teams look at that and just say he's not draftable? You want my hot take of the show? Sure. He he was real lucky that Ches Malushi got injured. I think that um, when you look at the way that the touches, the especially the rushes, were distributed in the couple games before. Lucy went down. He only played the first four games of the year. I think that new Luke Fickle coming in, new coaching staff didn't have, wasn't married to Braylon Allen potentially. I think you would have saw a much more split backfield. And even then, I mean, Allen didn't even get to a thousand yards in this final year here. And so I think that that's, that was an opportunity where uh, Lucy could have taken a bigger role and even stepped above him. And I think that he's trying to strike maybe when the iron's hot and kind of writing what he did, especially two years ago as a freshman. And that plays into why he didn't test because I think that there's, I I don't know. It just seems to me, uh, the idea of Braylon Allen is better than the reality of Braylon Allen. And, And I think that that's been the case for the last two years. Yeah. Some of the like pushback I would have on that, which I'm not really pushing back, but I guess just the the devil's advocate side of this would be that they transitioned to a scheme that doesn't fit Braylon Allen at all. And so they had him running a lot of zone stuff. That's not the player that he is. I mean, you've got to really get him in a downhill scheme, uh, very gap centric, but even then, you know, I just don't know that I know he comes in at R5, and maybe this is the cutoff for me where I'd rather take shots on guys later. Uh, maybe, like Jeff mentioned, there is a clear four, and then there is the cut. Uh, to me, Braylon Allen is just uh, – there's nothing special about him other than he's young and he had early production. And to me, that stuff doesn't weigh super heavily. I know that he can handle a large workload, but if he's not doing anything with the – the workload i don't know that he's going to get playing time and so to me this is a player i'm avoiding at cost uh in in dynasty and i'm happy to be wrong on him but this is aj dylan 2.0 to me everyone was pretty excited about aj dylan coming out of uh, boston college i think that aj dylan was a really really good athlete though and and his testing really helped his draft stock put him into day two i don't think this is a day two player maybe i'm wrong maybe he goes in round three but 
if he goes on day three, maybe even like round four, round five, I'm, I'm very much so out on Braylon. He has to go to an established line. He's got to get an offensive line that can really elevate his game a little bit um, and not go to one that's going to struggle in, in, their, in run blocking. Because I, as big as he is, I still think he struggles sometimes and like, you know, stops, you know, stop, start situations, the line of scrimmage. Like, I think that he, he does not have that acceleration to get up. Like he's going to need to push off the line and he's going to need to be able to get downhill four or five yards. And that's really where his strengths lie. Um, and, you know, I went into the scouting part of this with him was just a completely like blank slate. I knew I had my preconceived notions, but I wanted to go on bank and he came out a little higher for me probably because I do think that he has upside. He can score touchdowns to do those things. Um, but overall, yeah, maybe at top four, you're willing to move on, right? And, and trade back or whatever you are in your rookie drafts before we know capital. Um, but those first four are guys that if I'm in a dynasty startup, I'm pretty comfortable drafting at some point based on their ADP. After that, there's a big cutoff. Now we are going to go in even deeper here um, on the podcast. We're going to talk about that. But those are our top five guys right now. Let us know in the comments on YouTube, though, what you think of them. Yeah, but the full version of every show can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcast. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you head over there, search up the Football Guys Dynasty Football Show, subscribe, leave us a review, do all the things over on the podcast feed. 